We have had uh, a fantastic year this year. This is a summary of, of our statistics. What's, uh, what's noteworthy is that this is the first year, to my recollection, that we've uh, reconnected and, and restored over a thousand uh, miles of rivers and streams. And uh, there's a reason for that, and it's largely because of you and all of the amazing contributions that you make to the organization. You know, these numbers are steadily rising since COVID. I don't think we're quite at the pre-COVID levels yet, but the arc is going exactly in the right direction. And it's, it's your commitment, uh, your sacrifices, that make it possible for us to be so successful with our conservation work. And there's a few reasons that I'm feeling really optimistic for the future. This year, or actually it was a year and a half ago, we, we came up with this new concept of uh, priority waters creating a national network of priority waters. We, some of you have heard me use this line before, but we're, we're like the old Soviet Union in that we do these five-year strategic plans, hopefully to greater effect than they. But the big idea from this plan was uh, we wanted to use what, what I liken to the Tom Sawyer approach to conservation. And, and you'll recall that Tom got in trouble from Aunt Polly uh, for being a bad kid and she made him go out and whitewash the fence. And Tom uh, did that chore with such alacrity and seemed to be having so much fun doing it that soon all of his friends joined in. And, and our whole approach to Priority Waters is uh, many hands make light work. And so what we did in developing this network of Priority Waters was we work with the chapters and the councils, we work with our state and federal partners, and the hope is that we'll be able to begin lever leveraging hundreds of millions of dollars instead of the tens of millions that we're leveraging now. And, and, and the signs are promising right now because as you see here, we've already raised over 100 million, it's actually 110 million through the Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act for work on ecosystem resilience projects and watershed restoration projects. And I expect that, that this number will only increase over time. This is just, they're in their first year of implementation. These are five-year bills, so I expect the trend line to continue to go up and uh, our, accomplish to our accomplishments to continue to go up. So I occasionally like to uh, give this talk in the context of, of a favorite piece of literature, and I'm going to do that uh, today. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the boy, the mole, the fox, and the horse, but um, this is a book that my brother Nick, who is an investment banker uh, in New York, gave me. Nick is a big, strong guy. He was a middle linebacker on our high school football team. He was all county. This is not the book that you would expect Nick to give you. Um, but the book is its ostensibly about uh, a lonely boy, uh, a mole who likes cake, uh, a, a horse that can fly, and a quiet fox. But in reality, the book is about our relationships with one another and how those relationships propel us to be better people and ultimately to make the world a better place. And if there's a better frame for Trout Unlimited than that, I can't think of it. So let's start with uh, the horse is the last to join the group, but he's often the wisest. And the horse says uh, to the boy, asking for help isn't giving up. It's refusing to give up. And if there's a better example of that than uh, Glenn Place, our chapter president from Rhode Island 225, I'm not aware of it. So when uh, Glenn was faced with an insurrection in his ranks, basically a segment of his chapter split off and created another organization called Protect Rhode Island Brook Trout because they were frustrated that the chapter continued to stock over native fish in the Wood River, which is a priority water uh, for, for the Rhode Island 225. So rather than give up, Glenn not only convinced the chapter to stop the practice, he actually got them to oppose it in writing. And then he didn't stop there, he actually worked in partnership with Protect Rhode Island Brook Trout and other partners, and I actually had the pleasure of being a part of this, and, and they removed a dam on Flat Creek, a small dam on Flat Creek that had blocked passage for this important source of cold water into the Wood River. Um, so what, what I think few people can probably understand the complexity 
unless you've experienced it, of being a chapter president. But they are incredible leaders in the places that we live, love, and fish. So let's give all of our chapter leaders a big round of applause. In the Huron Manistee National Forest in Michigan, there are over a thousand culverts that won't per pass fish. And these are simply the pipes that go under roads. Typically, they were built during the logging era. So they, they would build roads to go in and log the woods, and they had to put the rivers somewhere, so they ran them under the roads. So if these fish can't move in response to flood and fire and drought, then we're going to lose them. And so part of the challenge in the Huron Manistee is that Within the forest boundary, it's 50% private land. And as you can imagine, in much of rural America, there's a little bit of distrust for the government. And so one of the important roles that TU plays is that we're the bridge between these private landowners who really are a little bit distrustful of the government um, and, 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 and their conservation objectives. And so uh, a great example of that is here on Hinton Creek, Jeremy Geist, and our other staff in the area, they work to fix 12 perched culverts uh, in the, near the uh, town of Cadillac, Michigan, and ultimately ended up recovering 25 miles of brook trout habitat. Again, the Hinton Creek flows into the Manistee, which is another priority water for us. Most important that this is an approach that can be replicated and is being replicated all across Michigan and Wisconsin. The mole asks uh, the boy, is your glass half empty or half full? And the boy says, I think I'm just grateful to have a glass. If there's a better demonstration of gratefulness and optimism than the Arizona Council and its chapters, I'm not aware of it. Arizona is the southernmost terminus for uh, native trout in the United States. And uh, if they're, they are such strong advocates for these fish, I have participated probably in seven or eight of their native trout conferences, and I keep going because I'm so impressed by them. They're, they're, they're relentless, they refuse to give up. It would be easy to say in the face of the you know, dramatic fires and the prolonged drought to give up on Gila trout and Apache trout, but they refuse to give up on them. And the Apache trout is a particularly cool story. So back in 1939, an old timer was recorded as saying, it wouldn't be, back between 1898 and 1914, it was no big deal for a kid to go out with a fishing rod and catch 100 trout in a couple hours and 200 trout in a full afternoon. And as you can imagine, that kind of fishing pressure took its toll. Historically, there were 700 miles of Apache trout habitat, ha rivers that held Apache trout. By the mid-1950s, it was down to 30. And so the Apache trout, uh, the, I'm sorry, the White Mountain Apache tribe in 1955 shut the area to fishing. Now remember, this is 20, 30 years before the Endangered Species Act. They effectively saved this fish from becoming extinct. And then they spent the intervening decades doing restoration work with Fish and Game, with federal agencies, with TU. And just a few years ago, one of our scientists, Dan DeWalter, was asked to lead a special status assessment of the fish so the Fish and Wildlife Service could determine how healthy it was. And based on the findings of that report, the Fish and Wildlife Service has proposed delisting the Apache trout from the protections of the Endangered Species Act because it's recovered. This is the first time in the 50-year history of the Endangered Species Act that we've ever delisted a salmonid. You know, I, I never knew how damaging cranberry bogs could be to rivers. To build a cranberry bog, the first thing you do is you go in and you clear cut all the vegetation from the sides of the river. And then you take tons and tons of gravel and sand and dump it in the river and create dams every thousand feet or so. What you're basically trying to do is reverse the flow of the river to create a bog that you can grow cranberries in. This is the farming equivalent of suction dredge mining for fish. It's really bad. And uh, back in the 50s, the Quashnet River was part of what was considered the longest cranberry bog in the world. And then in 1954, a hurricane came through and severely damaged the bog, and the owners basically abandoned it. 
And that's when the Southeastern Mass and Cape Cod chapters of TU stepped in. For 30 years, 40 years, they have every month consistently had work parties where they go in and help to recover the natural sinew. They take out the dams. They, they put wood structures in that help to recover the natural sinuosity of the river. They've planted over 4,000 trees in the area, and they had to create this innovative approach to planting the trees because when they planted them in the ground, they would rot because it was so wet. And so they plant these trees on mulch. And the most amazing thing is there was no heavy equipment involved. It was all done by hand. 450 volunteers donating 26,000 hours to help recover the quash net. Is Fran Smith in the audience? He, he's over there. This is Fran over here on the right. I think he was a slightly younger man. <laughs> he, he told me that um, after this picture was taken and they pushed this boat of rocks up the river, this guy on the left never came back. Fran is a true hero of conservation. I, I went up to see the Quashnet this summer, and I didn't get to meet Fran then, but everyone I talked to said, you got to talk to Fran, you got to talk to Fran. And then when I got back here, Jeff, I asked Jeff Yates and Beverly, I said, do you, do you know this guy, Fran Smith? And they said, no, we don't know him. And I said, how come we don't know him? And, and they said, because he doesn't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Before they started restoration on the quash net, we used to have 100, 10, 10 fish per 1,000 feet. Today they have 400, 650, feet, uh, 650 fish per 1,000 feet. It's an amazing success story. So we work really closely with our partners on the Olympic Peninsula, NOAA Fisheries. The, the OP is unique in that half of all of the uh, De the fish that are not listed under the Endangered Species Act in the state of Washington persist in the OP. The problem is that there's about 4,000 miles of habitat that isn't accessible, again, because of this problem of blocked or undersized or perched culverts. And so Luke Kelly and our partners at Wild Salmon Center and, and other partners went out and surveyed this summer, I think it was over, they found 600 culverts that were undocumented but were blocking uh, passage for fish. And the good news is that we reached an agreement with NOAA Fisheries as part of the infrastructure law for significant funding to get after this problem. And by the time we're done, we'll have reopened over 150 miles of some of the most productive salmon and steelhead habitat on the OP. The mole says to the boy, one of our greatest freedoms is how we react to things, which I thought was so funny and profound. But there's no better example of that than on the Klamath. We talked about this a little bit last night, but the, the story of the Klamath is, should be relatively well known. In 2000, 2001, the Clinton administration made the decision to shut off the irrigation to the Klamath irrigators in order to save an endangered fish upriver. It was not a salmonid, it was actually a sucker. And uh, there was tremendous social and economic dislocation uh, near riots as a result of that. She's getting families' livelihoods were affected. And then the next year, the Bush administration came to office and did the opposite. The pendulum swung the other way. And they basically opened up all the irrigation water to the farmers. And as a result of that, there were seriously low flows in the Klamath system. And we lost over 50,000 fish that year. Not surprisingly, several years later, um, as a result of losing an entire year class of fish, they had to shut down the commercial commercial. Uh, salmon fishery off the coast of California. We didn't walk away, you know, we didn't give up. Instead, we formed a tight coalition with the tribes in the area, with other nonprofits like American Rivers and Cal Trout, and we work with state and federal agencies to talk to Pacific Power who own these dams. And I had lunch two weeks ago with Pat Wrighton. Uh, Lindsay Slater and I had lunch with Pat Wrighton, who was the president of Pacific, Cor uh, Pacific Power at the time. And he told me, Chris, it was just common sense. We were going to have to relicense these dams, which meant that they had to uh, update typically a 30 to 40 year license and make it uh, compliant with contemporaneous environmental laws. And he said it was going to cost us more to do that than we could generate in power. And so it just made sense to work with that coalition 
to take the dams out. And I'm happy to re report, and here you see Amy and Brian Johnson celebrating there, Amy Cordalis on the left, and Brian there right next to her, celebrating because this summer, we removed the first of the four Klamath dams, and we'll take on the next three in the next couple of years, and we are this close to recovering 450 miles of habitat for salmon and steelhead that have been lost for over 100 years. The Klamath is the example, it's the, it's the model for us on the Snake River. We are down to 1% to 2% of our historic populations of salmon and steelhead on the Snake right now. In the 1950s, before the dams were constructed, they had a two-month fishing season in the Middle Fork uh, of the Salmon in Idaho, which, by the way, is wilderness-quality land. You could take two fish a day for two months they haven't had a wild fishing season in Idaho since the mid-70s. The, the problem is that there are now 170 miles of bathwater warm, predator-laden reservoirs between the spawning habitat for these fish. And the fish simply cannot get up or down and through those, those reservoirs. And so back a few years ago, Congressman Mike Simpson, a Republican from Idaho, he proposed Let's figure out how to make all of the people who depend on the dams whole, socially and economically whole, and then let's take out the four lower Snake River dams. That plan was, the architect of that plan was Lindsay Slater, and so it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that that's why we hired Lindsay to replace Steve Moyer. <laughs> Soon after that, uh, Governor Inslee and Senator Murray from Washington State, both Democrats, they, came, they did a similar process, and they hired a consultant to find out what will it cost to replace the benefits of these dams. And they came up with a number between like 14 and $26 billion. And right after that, NOAA Fisheries, the federal agency responsible for implementing the Endangered Species Act for anadromous fish, salmon and steelhead, they came out with a scientific paper that basically said, you cannot recover Snake River salmon without taking out the dams something we have known for a long time. So these fish, they are both, my friend Russ Thoreau, who's a biologist in Idaho, he calls them mountaineers and mariners. They connect the sawtooths in Idaho to the Pacific Ocean. They are as culturally significant to the tribal nations in the area as anything you can imagine. They define these rural communities, and they have forever. It would be a stain on this country's honor. It would be a sin if we let these fish slide into extinction. We can replace every single social and economic benefit provided by those dams, every single one of them. But these fish, they need a river. And by gosh, we're going to give them one. So the boy, the fox, and the mole get stuck in this big windstorm, and the horse says, when the big things feel out of control, focus on what you love right under your nose. And our work is, it, some of our work is very complicated. We work on things like reforming the 1872 mining law and uh, passing Good Samaritan legislation, Western water law. But some things are right in front of our nose. And a great example of that was some of the pioneering work that... Um, Warren Collier early on and, and now uh, 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 Jim Dorito have done on the Bear River. 20 years ago, so the bear has these adfluvial populations of Bonneville uh, cutthroat trout. These are populations that live in Bear Lake and then they move up the tributaries to spawn. The problem is that these tributaries were blocked by irrigation ditches or fences or uh, perch culverts or block culverts. And so 20 years ago we began work to reopen these. And we've had this really neat program called Adopt-a-Trout that the Wyoming Council does. And we found, and then what they do is they tag these, these trout and then they track where they migrate. We, we found that they migrate up to 54 miles to spawn. It, it shows why reconnecting these systems are so important. Anyway, we discovered that a few miles upstream, I think it was 14 miles upstream of Evanston, uh, Wyoming, there was a dam that was blocking their passage. And so uh, the, the problem was that uh, landowners were using 
the water behind the dam is their drinking water. And so we went in with our partners and we built, we dug wells for those people who were dependent on that water. And then we took the dam out and did restoration of that river bend. And the fish can now move up into another 25 or so miles of habitat. When we first started working in Bear Lake, 5% of the fish in the lake were wild. Today, it's over 70%. And the Asabo River, the uh, Asabo River hatchery had proposed increasing hatchery production from 30,000 fish per year to 300,000 fish per year. And you could imagine the nutrient loading, i.e. the fish poop that would have been washing into the Asabo, our birthplace river, this is the river that Trout Unlimited was founded on, if that proposal had been successful. And our friends at, uh, the friends of the, or anglers of the Asabel, they took this, uh, opposing this project on, and not only did they prevail in beating it back, they ended up buying the hatchery. And they now run this hatchery as a, uh, a community center where kids and families can come in for free and learn about the ecology of the river. But what makes it even cooler, though, is that Brian Burroughs and our uh, Michigan TU team are, have, are working with the anglers of the Asable to take out two impediments to the river that were formed by the hatcheries and thereby opening up 24 miles of, of river in TU's first home water. The boy says, we have, su we have such a long way to go, and the horse says, but yes, look how far we've come. Look how far we've come indeed. So in 2010, we first asked the EPA to use their authority under the Clean Water Act to protect Bristol Bay and its remarkable salmon fisheries. In 2014, after a rigorous scientific assessment, they did what we asked. The proponent for the mine then litigated. The litigation held up implementation of the protections. There was an election in 2016. The EPA then settled the litigation with the Pebble Limited Partnership, that's who the proponent was, and, and basically said, okay, you've got a couple of years to get a permit for the mine. And then uh, in 2019, the EPA lifted the protections that had been put in place in 2014. We litigated that decision. We're not a litigious organization, but we thought that they didn't follow the law in doing that. And then come 2020, the EPA, under the Trump administration, denied the essential permit that the Pebble Limited Partnership needed to build the Pebble Mine. And we prevailed in our litigation. Enter the Biden administration, who then used our litigation as the justification for expanding the protections in Bristol Bay. And Bristol Bay is now protected from industrial scale mining. But the fact is the only way we will ever fully protect Bristol Bay is by withdrawing the underlying mineral estate, not allowing mineral entry into that area. But this group, all of you, and Nellie Williams and her team should feel very, very good about the role that TU has played in protecting the world's most important salmon fishery. It's not quite the soap opera that has been Bristol Bay, but the Tongass National Forest is another great demonstration of TU's ability to stick to an issue. The Tongass has 25% of the world's temperate rainforests. 40% of the fish that swim along uh, the Pacific coast come from, are, are born in its waters. It's our largest national forest. And um, the, it had been protected by something called the roadless rule. This is something I actually uh, cut my teeth on many years ago, right before I came to TU. And it effectively pre prevents road construction in about 50 million, 58 million acres of land, including 9 million acres of the Tongass. Um, and because it prevents road construction, it prevents most other forms of development as well. The governor of Alaska didn't like the application of the roadless rule to the Tongass. And so he asked President Trump to lift it. And President Trump did that. Happily for us, though, the Forest Service had a different perspective, and they really want to move in a different direction on the Tongass, one that's not based on uh, logging. Instead, it's based on protecting old growth and restoration. And so in this year, uh, 
we actually had the roadless rule reestablished on America's largest and fishiest national forest. Yeah, you can clap for the Tongass. <laughs> a, quick, a quick aside. I was taken to a place called Port Hooton. It's a roadless area in the Tongass. Um, years ago by a former employee, Tim Bristol. It was before I even worked here. And I had heard everybody talk about all oh, steelhead fishing this, steelhead fishing this, fish of a thousand casts. And we flew into this place on a, on a float plane and we, had, and we hiked in and camped on firm ground. And then I walked up a couple miles. And as I'm crossing this little creek, it's, not, it's no, no wider than the stage, I see about 10 fish right in front of me in a pod. And so I freeze. And I cast and I lined the pod right in the middle of the pot. And they all just kind of moved over. Nobody <laughs> swam away. And then on my second cast, I actually hooked one and I caught one. And I was like, oh this is easy. I fished for five more days in the rain. No more fish. <laughs> the first and last steelhead I ever caught. The North Coast uh, Coho Project is an another great demonstration of um, Trout Unlimited's willingness to commit to a community or a set of communities in this case. The North Coast is made up of some really famous rivers like the Navarro and the Eel, the Russian River. These are legendary, fabled rivers. And we started working there, Mary Ann King and Anna Halligan, way back in 2008. And since that time, they have reconnected 70 miles of river. They have done restoration on over 170 miles of river. And the results of their work are that effectively, I think it's 72,000 dump trucks full of sediment have been kept from flowing into those rivers because of their work. And that work will continue because they just received a $6 million investment through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Fund, or law. So the Grand Canyon, this is a great story. Um, in 2010, we were worried that uh, proposed uranium mining in the headwaters of uh, the, uh, 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 where's Lee's Ferry? The Colorado, jeez. <laughs> in the headwaters of the Colorado, that it could be carried downstream into Lee's Ferry on the Colorado River. And, you know, the, the, and Lee's Ferry, it's, it's exceptional. I'm not sure if any of you fished it, but we're talking like 20,000 fish per mile. And so, because of the ar uh, archaic nature of the 1872 mining law, the only way to stop that mining from happening was to go through this Byzantine process of segregating the area from mineral entry for two years, and then the Secretary of Interior had the permission to withdraw it for 20 years. And so we, we finished that process, we went through that in 2012. And then, Nate Reese and others uh, are, are great partners in Arizona TU and National Wildlife Federation. We worked really closely with the tribes. We, we tried mightily to pass legislation, and we actually got a couple bills through the House, but uh, Lindsey Slater yesterday noted that uh, Congress is dysfunctional these days. It, Congress puts the fun in dysfunction. Um, so anyway, we, we couldn't quite get the the bills over the finish line and signed into law. And so we pivoted strategies and decided to try to make this area a national monument. And I'm pleased to tell you that we succeeded this year in protecting, President Biden signed a, a proclamation protecting over a million acres uh, surrounding the Grand Canyon and protecting Lee's Ferry. And I want to read you what uh, President Theodore Roosevelt said when uh, he, so the Grand Canyon, it's not a park. It's actually, it's a monument. It was designated as a monument back in 1903. And what President Roosevelt said at the time was, leave it as it is. We cannot improve on it, not a bit. The ages have been at work on it, and we can only mar it. Exactly. So I have just spent probably 30 minutes or so talking about these incredible fisheries and these amazing places. And a cynic could say, and I know there are no cynics among us, but a cynic could say, come on, Chris, you know, 
you're protecting Bristol Bay because you love to fish Bristol Bay. And you're restoring rivers like the eel because by so doing, you're going to make your fishing better in the eel. You know, Trout Unlimited is nothing but a self-serving organization. And I know you know this, but nothing could be further from the truth. I had the pleasure, the privilege, um, of being invited by Mike Lubick of Kentucky to participate in something called Real Recovery this year. And Real Recovery is one of these programs that uses fly fishing to help men who have cancer uh, develop camaraderie and, and relief, basically. And when I got there, I met a man, a cancer survivor, who, upon surviving cancer, had volunteered at 30 of these, these, these events, their weekend-long events. And uh, he told me about one event last year in northern Michigan where uh, this younger man uh, who was participating in the camp um, was just ebullient. He was, you know, he, was, he had the passion of a convert when it came to being just overjoyed to have learned how to fly fish. And he told all the participants in the camp how he couldn't wait to get home and take his daughters fishing. And sadly, he died before Christmas this year. I met another man who told me, uh, I, I was given by my doctors a 10% chance of living for two more years. And, you know, I kind of just looked down at my shoes when he said that. And he said, hey, hey man, don't, don't worry. I plan to be one of the 10%. And, and Mike had me call the uh, found one of the founders of Real Recovery, a man named Stan Golub, and I wrote this down when I talked to him because I just thought it was so profound. He said, what amazes the men with cancer is the love and compassion of their fishing buddies. Pure strangers come to love and care for them. The whole of what we do is so much greater than the sum of all its parts. Now, Real recovery, casting for recovery, project healing waters, the Mayfly project, a few of those were with us uh, happily this weekend. They basically, all of them have the same basic strategy of using fly fishing to help provide solace for men and women and wounded veterans and, uh, and foster kids. And I have participated in most of these events in one of the one of the more fun days that I have had at Trout Unlimited was when I guided Sue um, at a Casting for Recovery event in Georgia. Now, I want to be clear that it was purely a coincidence that Sue was the only woman who didn't catch a fish at this <laughs> outing. This summer, the Massanutten chapter of TU down in Virginia invited me to attend something called the Beaver Creek Invitational. And I watched as this Vietnam veteran caught his first trout on a fly, and I'm not joking, even with my tendency at hyperbole, it was every bit of 20 inches. And the smile on his face was like the smile I remember on my boys when they would walk down the stairs on Christmas morning when they were little. This is a boy named, a man, young man named Aaron. Uh, I met him at a Trout in the Classroom event in New York City. I believe Beverly might have been with me on this one. And the reason I show, and Aaron is a, you know, he's a, he was a high school senior. He, you know, trout, we think of Trout in the Classroom as typically being for little kids, but he was 17 years old. And he told us how Trout in the Classroom had changed his life. He said that it was the first time in my life I was ever responsible for another living creature. So, I have participated in most of those, if not all of these programs that use uh, fly fishing as a form of therapy. And there is a common denominator that runs through them all. And that common denominator is you. TU is the volunteer labor source for all of those programs. Now, I know it's true. We do make rivers healthier. And we do make fishing better, and we shouldn't be embarrassed or hide from that. 
But the whole of what we do is so much greater than the sum of the parts. Hearkening back to Stan's comment. We live today in a, an era of what's in it for me. And Trout Unlimited is the antidote to selfishness. You counter the desperation of a cancer diagnosis or of a veteran with PTSD or of a lonely child with love and compassion. When others look across the landscape and they see loss and degradation, you all see the opportunity to recover hope through restoration. You all bridge divides. Now, when I was in high school, the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus, was run by a remarkable man named Pedro Arupe. And Father Arupe used to implore us to be men and women for others. You are all men and women for others. And for that, I thank you.